our song. Now we're going to get on with our study of God's word this morning. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles. I trust you got Bibles. You really need them for our services together because this is God's word that we look at. You don't need my opinion. You need to hear God's voice. So we're in God's word. First Kings is the book, and we're in chapters 15 and 16 today. First Kings chapter 15. Before we get any further, let's pray together. Father, indeed, because in our Savior Jesus Christ, we are secure, we are safe. We can truly sing that I am happy and blessed in the fullest sense of those words, not the circumstantial happiness dependent on our experiences being what we would have ordered. But Lord, because you are the sovereign God and you love us, we truly can be at peace and yes, happy. Lord, I pray for us. You know our needs. You know what we're going through. Everyone that is part of this service this morning, you know what we're going through. And you know that we need to hear a voice, a word from you. So now we go to your word, your living and active word, and we come to it confident that it is every bit as relevant to us in our experience today as it was on the day it was first penned. And so we come eager to hear what you have to say to us through it. And so please, Lord, would you speak? Would you give words to these lips of mine and let them speak your word, faithfully expounding your written word in the power of your Holy Spirit alone? And Lord, for all who are listening and following along in their Bibles, please also send your spirit and power. Help us to understand what you have to say and what it means to us. And get for yourself the praise and glory that you deserve. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our text this morning starts in the middle of chapter 15 of 1 Kings, goes all the way to the end of chapter 16 as we continue where we started last week in chapter 14 of 1 Kings. And if you haven't uh, watched that sermon yet, then maybe after this go and see what you missed last week and then you'll, this will make sense, I trust. But a story to begin this message this morning comes from April 1945. It was in the closing days of World War II on the European front. The war was winding down in Europe. The only question left was, how long can the Nazis hold on? Berlin was approaching its breaking point. It was in its last gasp. One evening, Hitler's assistant chief of staff was driving toward Berlin to attend one of the Fuhrer's night conferences. He was encouraged as he drove in his chauffeur-driven car to see flying overhead a formation of Luftwaffe planes that were flying, heading south. He got to the meeting that evening and a Luftwaffe officer told the conference about a successful air attack that had been perpetrated on Soviet tanks in the south. Ah, those were the planes that the officer had seen fly overhead. Everyone took a sip of encouragement from at least one small victory in a war that had gone so wrong for them. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before their encouragement evaporated into nothingness because it turned out those Soviet tanks they had thought they had destroyed, well, actually, they had been the buses and the trucks of the German army convoy that was heading south. So the German Air Force had blown up their own kind. And I think, what a picture that is. What a perfect picture of what our human scheming so often accomplishes. We try to get what we think will secure our place and make us happy, and we end up destroying our own purposes in the process. Well, we are on a journey through this historic book of 1 Kings, and by history, I don't simply mean distant, long-lost history. I mean this is our history, Christian 
If you belong to Jesus Christ, this is your family story. And in the section of the story we're in right now from chapters 14 to 16, we were reading about the division of the one people of God, the one nation of Israel that takes place after Solomon dies. And the one people of God now has been divided into two separate kingdoms. There's the southern kingdom of Judah with Jerusalem at its heart, and that's where the descendants of David rule. But now there's also the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel with its own king. Ten of the tribes are encompassed in that northern kingdom. And last week we looked at three of the kings of the south, starting with Solomon's son Rehoboam and ending up and focusing especially on good King Asa, Rehoboam's grandson, Solomon's great-grandson, a king who we are told followed after God in his life. Now in our text today, we're going to take an express tour through the lives of six kings in the northern kingdom of Israel. And obviously with so many kings to look at with such a short amount of time at our disposal, these are going to be very quick glimpses at each of these kings in turn. And there are going to be so many details that we're going to have to leave out, unfortunately. But what you are going to see, I trust and pray, is there's a whole lot of muscle flexing going on and attacks on rivals, threats to the northern kingdom of Israel from within that northern kingdom. And it turns out in the end that the people who are most hurt by that scheming, just like the German Air Force, are the very people that are doing the scheming. We pick up the story in verse 25 of chapter 15 of 1 Kings. Why don't you take a look there? 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 25. Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel for two years. First thing I want you to notice about this new king on the scene in the northern kingdom is his name, Nadab. Now, if you know anything about biblical history or the Exodus in particular, you've heard this name before. You may not be able to place it, but Nadab sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Well, this is why. Moses' brother in the time of the Exodus, his right-hand man, was Aaron. Aaron, the high priest, the very first high priest of the nation of Israel. He's the one, by the way, who made the golden calf while Moses is up on the mountaintop of Sinai in the presence of the living God, the rescuer, the promise giver of joy and life and freedom and a new land to his people. Moses is up there with that God. And while Moses is up on the mountaintop receiving God's instructions for how this new, special, particular, holy people people loved by the God of heaven, how they are to live for maximum joy and impact in a dark world. At that very moment of Moses' mountaintop experience, where's Aaron? He's down in the valley below at the foot of the mountain making a calf out of gold for the people to worship. He makes it and he announces Hear, O Israel, here are your gods. And then he stands the lifeless statue on its podium in front of the gathered crowd. And then when Moses comes down the mountain with the stone tablets in his hand, engraved with the Ten Commandments, written by the finger, as it were, of the infinite, invisible, all-powerful God, there it is, he sees it as he gets low enough on the mountain. There it is, a direct assault on his eyes, this holy, delivered, new people of God who have finally tasted freedom. The chains of slavery have been broken after 400 years of oppression and now here they are partying in an orgy of depravity around a statue of an animal. This is not a story to be proud of. And I remind you of that because Nadab's father, King Jeroboam, made a golden calf himself. The first king of the northern kingdom, he made a golden calf himself for his people to worship. In fact, he had to one-up Aaron. So he made not one, he made two 
golden calves. And he introduced them to the people in almost word for word the way Aaron had done all those years before. He announced, here are your gods, O Israel. Now, is that just a coincidence? And on top of that, Aaron had sons who were also priests in Israel. His two eldest sons he named Nadab and Abihu. Names that have become infamous in history because they were the first two members of the people of God who were given the death penalty by God himself for false worship, for treating God lightly. Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2 tell the story These priests had just been ordained. They were all washed. They were dressed in their newly made priestly robes. They had their censers in their hand. They went to the altar to offer up their offering. They had the torch go in the censers. The burning heat was rising. They put incense on the censers to offer to God an incense offering that God didn't command himself them to do. And God said back in Exodus, don't do that. Nadab and Abihu did exactly that. And fire shot out from the Lord, Leviticus 10 tells us, and struck these brothers dead on the spot. Executed for offering unauthorized fire. That's where the name Nadab comes from. Now, I don't know about you, friends, but... As a dad, when you're a new parent and you've got a a bundle of joy that you're preparing to welcome into this world, and maybe the child is born, you haven't thought of a name yet, and you have a hard time because there are so many names to choose from. How do you choose a name out of all the options for your precious bundle of joy, the most prized child in the entire history of the world? How do you choose just one? Well, you have a bunch of criteria that you use, don't you? So you start asking yourself questions like, hmm, how does the name flow with the last name? Can't really change the last name, so let's make the two names flow. How many syllables will fit the syllables in the last name? Does anybody else in the family have this particular name? If so, not necessarily a bad thing, but is this the name that you want to remember your child by? Do you want to associate your child with that name that's already in existence in your family? Do you remember this person fondly? or is that name held by that creepy uncle who tells the painful jokes? Which brings me to one of the criteria that we all use when we're choosing a name for our child. And the question we always ask is, does this name have any connection to the people in history that I wouldn't want my child to be associated with in any way? So for example, I would never have named my child Adolf or Osama, they may have flowed with Falconer just fine, but the connotations, the associations are not what I would like to burden my child with. Those names are famous for all the wrong reasons, just like Aaron's sons. And yet Jeroboam, out of all the options he could have chosen, he chooses to name his son Nadab. Isn't that just a little strange? Doesn't it seem that this first king of the northern kingdom isn't celebrating the victories of God's people, whether it be with his golden calves or naming his sons, it seems like he is instead clinging to the failures of Israel's history. He's prizing the nation's humiliations instead of his triumphs. And sure enough, Nadab lives up to, or rather down to, his name. Nadab, just like Aaron's son before him, falls into the trap of worshiping the right God, but in the wrong way. Aaron learned from his mistakes. He got back on track, but Jeroboam and Nadab didn't. They doubled down. They increased their guilt. When it comes to religion and worship, Nadab is Jeroboam 2.0. Take a look at verse 26 of chapter 15. We have pronounced for us here God's verdict on this new king. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and his sin, which he made Israel to sin. 
Now pay attention there and get used to the wording of verse 26 here because that same message with minor variations along the way, this judgment is going to be pronounced over every single king who's going to take Nadab's place on the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel. Now remember, every single king, whether it's a king in the southern kingdom of Judah or in the northern kingdom of Israel, every single king is going to be judged in one way and one way only. And the criteria is this. Was this king faithful in following God as David had done? Or was this king evil? Did he do evil in the sight of the Lord as Jeroboam? had done. That's the criteria. Every king is measured according to where they fit on that scale. And the record of the southern kingdom in Judah, not great. It's a mixed bag. There are many disappointments along the way, and it gets worse as time goes on. But in the northern kingdom, there is not a single king who doesn't follow in Jeroboam's evil. Not a single one. So what happens to Nadab? Verses 27 to 29 tell us, Baasha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him, that's Nadab, and Baasha struck him down at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. So Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And as soon as he was king, He killed all the house of Jeroboam. So Nadab is on a military mission. Notice how that very fact reminds us that the golden years under Solomon are long gone. Those were years of peace and good relations with all the surrounding nations. Now Israel is fighting the Philistines. And while Nadab the king is fighting with his army, lying siege to the Philistine city, Camped against its walls, Nadab is killed in action. But he's not killed by enemy fire. He's, he's fragged. He's assassinated by his own side. Baasha, one of his own people, murders him and takes his throne while he's here with his military in battle. And yet it doesn't stop with the king. Baasha's not done yet. You see the end of verse 29 and into verse 30. As soon as he was king... He killed all the house of Jeroboam. He left to the house of Jeroboam not one that breathed until he had destroyed it, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. It was for the sins of Jeroboam that he sinned and made Israel to sin, and because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. Now everyone in Israel knows the judgment that God's prophet had pronounced on Jeroboam years ago. Baasha knew that just like everybody else did. So he could justify his slaughter of Jeroboam's entire family, not only Nadab, but everybody else in the family as well. He could justify that slaughter and even maybe pat himself on the back and say, I'm just doing God's work here. I'm on a mission from God. I'm God's instrument of judgment on a rebellious king. And then wouldn't you think that maybe, just maybe, in light of knowing God's pronouncement of judgment and seeing himself carry it out, wouldn't you think that perhaps Baasha just might decide that, well, if I'm the new sheriff in town, that maybe I should grab my broom and clean up these dirty streets and turn this nation back to God where it ought to be? Well, apparently that's not what he thought. Look at verse 34. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he made Israel to sin. So there's Baasha, the new king on the throne, walking the same old ways. One day as Baasha is sitting on his throne, doing his kingly things, there is a young prophet named Jehu who bursts into the palace, strides fearlessly up to the monarch, points a bony finger directly at the king, and piercing right through him with his steely gaze, Jehu the prophet launches directly into a thus says the Lord message. 
Look at chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. This is the word of Jehu speaking the word of the Lord. Since I exalted you out of the dust and made you leader over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel to sin, provoking me to anger with their sins, behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So God says, I gave you this throne. I took you and exalted you out of the dust and made you the leader of my people, my holy people. In other words, you were nothing. You were an indistinguishable grain of sand on a beach, but I chose you. Out of everyone else, I lifted you out of obscurity. I gave you a throne over not just any third-rate banana republic. I made you king over my people, the people of the God of heaven. And how have you shown me your gratitude? Well, you've ignored my word. In fact, you have done worse. You have run from my word. And because of that, thunders this young prophet, your whole family is going to end up exactly as Jeroboam's family. You know the one you destroyed? Verse 4 of chapter 16. Anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And anyone of his who dies in the field, the birds of the heavens shall eat. Everyone's going to be gone, and that's very much not an appealing picture or vision of the future, unless perhaps you're a dog or a bird and you see meal being served. But the prophet speaks, says his piece, then he makes an about face swivel, and he marches out of the palace exactly the way he came in, head held high. But that's it. No response. You read on. Basha doesn't do anything different. He goes on ruling, life continues on, nothing happens. In fact, Baasha rules for 24 years. That's a good long time, and it certainly doesn't sound like judgment. In fact, he dies in peace, he dies with honor, and when Baasha dies, his son takes over the throne that he left behind. So we're left wondering, what's all that prophesying and warning about? I don't see any consequences here. There's no fire coming down from heaven to consume this man. In fact, we've got a dynasty beginning here. We'll just hold on for a second because history doesn't neatly fall into one-hour episodes. Our stories are not concluded in a one-hour episode of Murder, She Wrote. Okay, that dates me a little bit. Our life stories aren't concluded in an episode of Magnum P.I. How's that? The new one, not the old one. The story goes on. Look at verse 8 of chapter 16. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Eli, or Elah, sorry, the son of Baasha, began to reign over Israel in Tirzah. And he reigned two years. Ah, there's a hint. Baasha may have reigned a long time. His son takes the throne, but he only lasts for two years as king. Maybe there's something to the prophet's message after all. In fact, Elah is sometimes called the playboy king, and you'll understand when you see what happened to him. Look at verse 9 of chapter 16. But his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him, when he was at Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the household in Tirzah, Zimri came in and struck him down and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. So what happened to Elah? Went to a party. That's what happened to him. And Zimri, who wasn't even a great military leader, just a mid-level officer who was in charge managing half of the chariots of the army, got together with another servant, Arza, who was in charge of the palace here in the king's, king, where the king reigned. Together they come and they hatch a plan to get rid of the king. They have to make sure that Elah's cup is always going to be full to overflowing at this party while he's carousing with the other guests. 
And he ended up drinking too much at the party, which apparently everybody knew he was probably going to do. That's why they would have an open door to get him. And once Elah was thoroughly drunk and his guard was down, verse 10 tells us Zimri comes in, strikes him down, kills him, and takes the throne in his place. Now, how humiliating an ending is this? I mean, as a king, you expect you've got chances of being killed in your duties, but you expect maybe it's going to be dying gallantly in a battle and you'll be heroized and, and looked up to, immortalized forever for your bravery. You're fighting for your people and you're struck down. Maybe there's even something rather noble about a king assassinated while he's standing up for the principles he believes in to govern his people wisely. But to get drunk because you're at a party and you don't have self-control so you dive into such a drunken stupor that you can't even defend yourself against an attack, that's not exactly what any of us would want our legacy to be. Now I know this isn't a passage that's directly about drinking, but kids, young people, all of us, let's pay attention. Think about what kind of positions you put yourselves into. If this was your last moment, is this the way you'd want to go out? Well, that's how Playboy King Elah is known to us almost 3,000 years later. Well, King Elah is assassinated and Zimri steps onto the throne. You see how matter-of-factly these violent overthrows of the king are being described for us? And maybe you think to yourself, well, that, that's no surprise. It's the way the world works. It's almost as if the Bible is saying, no, this is the way that life in happens in the kingdom of Israel. It's just like the rest of the world. But even if you're getting to expect this kind of thing, you can't be but taken aback at least a little bit when you read the very first executive order that is issued by newly crowned King Zimri. He decides to wipe out the entire family of Baasha. Look at verse 11 of chapter 16. When he began to reign... As soon as he had seated himself on the throne, he struck down all the house of Baasha. He did not leave him a single male of his relatives or his friends. So not only does he do to Baasha what Baasha did to Jeroboam's family, wiping them all out, leaving no survivors, Zimri goes even further. He destroys even his friends. Did you see that? So if you had any kind of positive relationship with the family of the old king, you were dead. Sounds like gangland violence, doesn't it? And this is the holy people of God? Well, just like in gang life today, if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to live the violent life, you better expect to die violently as well. So take a look at verse 15. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned seven days in Tirzah. So if Elah is known as the playboy king, Zimri is known as the one-week king, the one-week wonder. I mean, you've got jugs of milk in your refrigerator that have a longer lifespan than this king. So what happened to Zimri? Well, Zimri may have been a great hitman, but he wasn't quite so great at coalition building. We pick it up in verse 15 again and read to verse 17 of chapter 16. Now the troops were encamped against the Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, and the troops who were encamped heard it said, Zimri has conspired and he has killed the king. Therefore, all Israel made Omri the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. So Omri went up from Gibbethon, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. So clearly not everybody's excited to see Zimri on the throne. We didn't vote for this guy. We don't want him. We want the military chief. We want the brave commander of the army. We want Omri. He's the best. So they gathered a crowd for a mass protest. Omri takes the lead, and together they march up from their battle stations to the capital city of Tirzah, and they set a siege around it. Here's Omri. He's the king we want. We want you gone, Zimri. And Zimri may be violent. 
He may be evil, but he's not completely stupid. And he sees that there's no way he's coming out of this siege with the crown still on his head. In fact, he's likely not coming out of this siege with his head on top of his shoulders. This crowd is going to get its way. So what does he do? Verse 18. And when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over him with fire, and he died. So Zimri goes into his palace, sets fire to it, and commits suicide by burning his whole house down on top of himself. It's a violent end to a violent man, one week as king, and that's it for Zimri. So now Omri climbs the throne. And yet apparently not everybody wants Omri, verses 21 to 23 of our text. Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. But the people who all followed Omri overcame the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died and Omri became king. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri began to reign over Israel, and he reigned for 12 years. Six years he reigned in Tirzah. So there's a power struggle. After some kind of conflict within the nation, Omri gets the throne all to himself, and he rules over Israel for 12 years. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are familiar with the name Omri, the king of Israel? I mean, when you think of kings of Israel, what names come to your mind? Probably Saul, David for sure, Solomon, maybe some of the later ones, Uzzah, Josiah. When you think of Israel's kings, you probably don't think the name of Omri. And why would you? I mean, look, we're we're in 1 Kings chapter 16. He gets hardly a few verses in this one chapter, and that's all we know in 1 Kings about this King Omri. Well, you may not realize this, friend, but in the ancient world, Omri is one of the most famous kings that Israel ever had. There's one important archaeological find that was discovered some time ago from outside of Israel, the land of Moab. It's called the Moabite Stone. Archaeologists were delighted to find it. And on that Moabite stone, King Misha, the king of the Moabites in those days, admits by himself that Omri, king of Israel, humbled Moab for many years. He had a reputation for power outside. In fact, the Assyrians, who were the superpower of the day and rising in strength, they called the entire land of Israel the house of Omri. And they did that for the next 100 years. So this king, Omri of Israel, he made a mighty mark on the world of his day. And yet you notice in God's eyes, he only rates a handful of verses. And why is that? Verse 25, Omri did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did more evil than all who were before him. In other words, God says, I don't care about your exploits in the nations. I don't care about your military power. I don't care about your wealth. What I care about is, did you do right in my sight? He says that about Omri, and he says that about you and I too, friend. And when Omri dies, His son takes over. Son's name is Ahab, and this is our sixth and final king of our whirlwind journey through the tour of these kings. Verses 29 and 30 of chapter 16. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Now, Ahab is going to be on the scene for the next little while in the weeks ahead. So we're not going to spend time on him today except to point out a couple of things. I want you to notice, first of all, that we've got here a new dynasty in Israel. Father has passed on the throne to his son, which is rare in Israel, and unlike earlier, this son is not going to reign for just two short years. 
So this looks like this is the mark of a successful king ruling successfully in the world. Second thing I want you to notice here is Ahab's religious life. Obviously, he's a king from the north, so you already know before we even begin that he's not going to be a good king. He's going to sin, but there's more than that. Read verses 31 to 33 along with me. And as if it had been a light thing for him, that's Ahab, to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went in and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Wow. I mean, from the very beginning of the northern kingdom, the worship has been wrong. Jeroboam, he built those golden calves. He built the high places for the people to worship God away from Jerusalem where they were supposed to go. Jeroboam was worshiping the right God, but in the wrong way. He was judged as a sinner. He was judged as evil. He had a reputation that every king was judged. If you're evil, you're evil like Jeroboam. You think it can't get any worse than that. And then Ahab steps up to the throne and says, hold my drink. Here comes evil. And Ahab takes evil to a whole new level. Now the king isn't even pretending to worship Israel's God. He went and served Baal and worshipped him in the house of Baal, a temple for Baal that the king of God's people had created for this Canaanite God. Do you see the slippery slope here, friend? It's the same for us in our day as it is in the ancient Near East, in the biblical world. You start with worshiping God in any way you choose, and where do you end up? You end up ultimately not even worshiping God at all. Here's Ahab on the throne of Israel, and Baal worship has just become the state religion of God's people in the northern kingdom. And so you know this is not going to turn out well. So here we are now. We've seen three kings in the south. We've seen seven in the north. And in fact, you may not realize this, but all six kings in the northern kingdom that we've looked at today, all six of them ruled during the single reign of good King Asa in the south. All six of them. What does that tell you? What does that difference in number of kings tell you about the two kingdoms? Doesn't it show you the lack of stability in the north? There's no enduring dynasty. There's kings who last a couple of years, a, a few days even. Hardly any of these guys get to see their sons take on their throne, which is the goal of every king. Israel's looking more and more like that reed shaken by the water that God promised that they would be in chapter 14, verse 15, don't they? I mean, from a human perspective, you can have all sorts of reasons for why there's this instability in the northern kingdom among the kings. Geography, you could point to. Ambitious schemes, power struggles. It's just the way of the world. It's what happens in kingdoms. And I'm sure that that's what the newspaper of the day, the Assyrian Times or whatever it was, I'm sure that's what it would have reported in these kings rising and falling in this northern kingdom of Israel. We see it all through history, don't we? Assyria is growing in dominance at this very time. Then comes Babylon, then comes the Persians, then comes Alexander the Great and his Hellenistic Empire, and then Rome comes rising and falling, come empire and empire and empire. And we seem to be in the downward slide of the empire of our day, and yet the king's author is telling us there is so much more that the newspapers don't report in fact, at its root, the reason at the foundation of this instability is because the unrepentant sin of these northern kingdom's kings. This is the sinfulness. This is the covenant breaking of the kings of God's people. And at this point in biblical history, at this 
point in 1 Kings, God's word is comparing the relative obedience of the southern kingdom and its relative stability with the northern kingdom and its rebellion that has it floundering with wicked king after wicked king after wicked king after violent overthrow. So that's chapters 14 to 16. And now you've come to the end of this whirlwind tour and you're asking yourself, if you're like me, well, that's interesting, but what in the world does this have to do with me in 2021? Well, here's the principle for us, friend, that sin leads to social disintegration. Sin always inevitably leads to social disintegration. Uh, You need to see how relevant this is to North American life today, to Western civilization as a whole, friend. If you grew up in the 1960s or 1970s or earlier than the 60s, you would never have thought that you would see the social or moral disintegration that we're seeing before our very eyes today. I don't consider myself very old, no matter what my kids may say. But even me, in my early days of elementary school, I remember the first couple of years of elementary school, we would begin our day in public school by reciting the Lord's Prayer. We begin the school day by praying to the God of heaven, the God of the Bible. And when we had our Christmas pageants at school, they would actually be called Christmas programs and not winter fests or whatever they're called nowadays. And we would actually sing Christmas songs about the birth of the Savior of the world in Bethlehem stable. There's no way you would ever get away with that, any of that today. Of course, not everybody believed back then. Not everybody was a worshiper of Jesus Christ. That's a given. But it was the foundation upon which our society was built, that belief that this was the word of God, and there is a God, and there is a Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me ask you, do you think we're better off today than we were when the ideals of the Christian message bound us together as a society and as a country? Sin has its consequences, friend. And sin brings not only judgment and consequences to me as an individual on judgment day when God will pronounce a verdict on my life when I stand before him. And one of the problems that I see inside evangelical churches in our society today is that so often we become focused only on that part of sin's consequences. If you sin, you get bound up here on earth. You sin and you'll get judged on judgment day by God for all eternity. And that's true. And it's essential for everyone to come to terms with. But the problem is sin doesn't only bring God's final judgment on me as an individual in the presence of a holy God. In the future, on judgment day, sin also affects our world today. It impacts our life here. It brings present and ongoing social disintegration. Have you had a look around our society today? Do you feel like our world is integrated, united? Do you feel like we're all holding hands, pulling in the, on the oars, straining, at least going in the same direction? I've never seen as much division as I see today. I mean, there's division in the political sphere. sphere. We expect that. We don't always see things in the same ways when it comes to politics, but it goes so much deeper than that. Now there's division in the sporting world, in the entertainment world, in the shopping world. I mean, we have soft drink companies and sports leagues telling us who we should be doing business with and who we shouldn't. It seems to me that there are people in high places right now that want nothing more than to keep the population divided. And if you visit social media, you turn on the TV news, don't you get the feeling that the new way the world works is that you're supposed to pick a team, left or right. You're supposed to pick on one side or the other. You pick a team, you put on the jersey or the hat, 
And then your job is to hate everyone and everything that's on the other team, on the other side. And we don't listen anymore. If you come across anybody with a different point of view, you're not supposed to listen to try to understand a different perspective and think things through from a different angle. No way. That's not the game plan for today. The game plan is that you get your talking points from your team and then you run with them. And if anyone challenges you, don't dialogue with them. Call them names because they're obviously the enemy. They're obviously evil. Like the old saying, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth can get its boots on. And Proverbs affirms that. Proverbs 18 verse 17. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Or verse 13 of Proverbs 18, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. And social media just adds to that lack of hearing a full case. You see a meme on Twitter talk, or you see a grainy video on Facegram. And if the person who posted that was outraged and they're on my team, oh, well, then I know what i got to do. I've got to be outraged too. And so many people jump on whatever bandwagon is trending and start spewing anger at anyone who doesn't jump right on board. How do we get here? We get here because we've spent decades in our society throwing off every vestige of the Bible that we can every vestige of the book that was the foundation for our culture. There's no attempt to better try to understand and apply God's word. No, we've said we want no sound of God's voice in the public sphere. We will decide our own morality. We will decide our own sexuality. We will make our own definition of what wisdom and compassion are. And no longer do we see ourselves as creatures, special creatures of the infinite personal God. In fact, the only beings in the entire universe to be created in the image of God himself, to enjoy relationship with him and life forever in his presence and to reflect his glory on this earth. No, if we don't believe in God, we're not special creatures of him created in his image and we're certainly not all born in the state of sin and in need of a savior. Because there is no God, and we just are. John Gribben, an atheist scientist, wrote in his book, The Scientists, the most important thing that science has taught us about our place in the universe is that we're not special. Biologists tried and failed to find any evidence for a special life force that distinguishes living matter from non-living matter, concluding that life is just a rather complicated form of chemistry. For human life turned out to be no different from any other kind of life on Earth. As the work of Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace established in the 19th century, all you need to make human beings out of amoebas is the process of evolution by natural selection and plenty of time. In other words, We believe in science. Science can't prove that a human being is uniquely other, a soul and a body. In fact, science can't even really distinguish any difference at the the level of essence of existence between a human being and a hammer. We're all just different collections of molecules. And so we're free from answering to a God of heaven, but at what cost? And instead of coming together in the vision of John Lennon who imagined a world with no religion, no God, no heaven above us, only sky, in that kind of world he imagined all the people coming together and living life in peace. And obviously John Lennon wasn't a prophet because the reality of this society with no God is so far different from that. We're not growing together, we're we're pulling apart 
We're descending into tribalism where we define ourselves by what makes my tribe different from everyone else out there. And that way, we can always be the good guys and out there are the bad guys. And as long as the bad guys are on the other side, then you know what that means for me? It means I don't have to deal with the sin in my own heart. I never have to look at in myself and do sober self-examination. I can, I can fight outsiders. I don't need to fight my own fallen nature or grab hold of a savior. And we find ourselves today, I fear, in the place described by William Butler Yeats in his poem, The Second Coming, turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Because we've sown the wind, and now we're reaping the whirlwind. So is there any hope? Is there any hope after all of this? And I say, oh, yes, there is hope, friend. There is hope in this text. And if it feels like our society is spiraling out of control today, don't you think it would have felt that much more like that if you were living in Israel during the time of 1 Kings 15 and 16? Kings rising and taking each other out like gunfighters in the Wild West? But look at the text and see what's really going on. Back in chapter 15, why does Nadab only last two years? Well, because Baasha assassinated him, of course. Sure, yeah, true, but that's not the ultimate cause. There's deeper reason than that. Chapter 15, verse 30. Because of the anger to which he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel. Then there's Elah. Elah seems to be on top of the world. His dad grabbed himself a throne and a palace, but Elah only lasts for two years. Why? Because Zimri assassinated him, of course. Sure. But that's not the ultimate reason for his short reign. Look at verses 12 and 13 of chapter 16. Zimri destroyed all the house of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned and which they made Israel to sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Then Zimri's reign lasts only a week. Why so short? Because he commits suicide? Yes, again, yes, but again, not the ultimate reason. Verse 19 of chapter 16 It was because of his sins that he committed doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and for his sin, which he committed making Israel to sin. And over and over in our text here, we're reminded that no matter how much it looks like the world out there is raging out of control, no matter how much it looks like the rich and violent and powerful are ruthlessly ruling the day, behind the cosmic curtain where you cannot see with your physical eyes. There on the throne of the universe, there is God. And he's working out his purposes. He was doing that in Israel in the ninth century BC, and he's doing it today in 2021 AD. And it seems like the society we live in is ready to blow itself apart when the horizon seems so dark that you feel like God must have given up on Canada today, right now. Remember that there are godly people even in the northern kingdom of Israel who are watching all the turmoil going on around them I mean people not in palaces, not conquering on battlefields. I mean a remnant of God's people who were on their knees and praying and seeking God amidst the turmoil, begging him not to forget them, and God answers. God answers. He takes kings off of their throne. He sends a prophet, Jehu, in the darkness. He raises up a mighty Elijah that we're going to start looking at next week. He lifts kings up. He tears them down. And God always, always, always is working out his purposes. And throughout the history of the world, God has been working out his purposes in answer to the prayers of his people. 
all through history. Remember, in fact, it was in the darkest days in the grip of the foreign pagan superpower Rome that God sent his son to save his people from their sins and to take the universe's throne. He sent him then into that darkness. And I have no doubt, friend, whatsoever that what we see going on in the world around us today is God shaking the tree of sham securities that we have built for ourselves even inside the church and answering the humble prayers of his people on their knees who have been praying for years and years and years, God, would you revive your church? Could it be that he's doing that right now in the midst of all of this? So don't be upset, friend. Don't be anxious, Christian. You can put down your political placards and you can get on your knees and you can pray on. Just pray on and trust on that the God who took on flesh to save this world and claim for himself a people including you if you put your trust in Christ's finished work that he is still on the throne today. And if your hope is firmly fixed not on a politician but on Jesus Christ, let me assure you, you will never ever be disappointed because he is at work and he loves you. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your word that speaks to us in dark times. Lord, we see that our history has been enacted in various ways. Yes, the specifics are different, but the story is the same. A world that seems raging, a world that seems sliding into chaos and oblivion is a world where you still are on the throne and you are working out your good purposes. And you're not forgetting your plan, let alone your people that you loved enough to send your son for. And you will accomplish all that you desire. So help us to keep our eyes on you, I pray. And give us hearts of prayer that would seek hard after you in this situation and every other. And then give us hearts that can trust and rest in you. Because you are faithful. You've proved it time after time after time. We need to be faithful in our trust. So help us, Lord, and have your way. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.